We've got three great speakers lined up who are deeply engaged with climate policy and the active search for solutions. I'm pleased to say that we're joined by Yvonne Aki Sawyer, mayor of Freetown in Sierra Leone, which like many cities in Africa has large numbers of people living in informal settlements that can have a real impact on the natural habitat. Sarah Hansen Young has been pushing a green agenda focused on preserving biodiversity in Australia, where she became the country's youngest senator. And we're also joined by Ma Jun, he is China's most prominent climate campaigner. He's best known for his work in improving water quality, uh, but his, uh, his thoughts go way beyond, of course. So please do get in touch with us. Please do send me your questions, and I will try my best to get those to the panel uh, if time allows. We have uh, 20 minutes or so for this first conversation, so please do get in touch if you would like to, and please do answer our polling question. Uh, let's get to our panel conversation then, and let's go first to let's go first to Mayor. Uh, set up our conversation, if you could. Uh, thinking then, Marjorie, about the subject that we asked in our in our polling, and we'll get to the results shortly. Uh, do you think that COVID nineteen has sparked renewed concern uh, globally about the far greater threat of climate change? How would you link COVID nineteen, the fight there, with climate change, Marjorie? Get us started. It's such a pleasure to join this conversation. And um, uh, yeah, we all have seen the uh, devastating catastrophe, you know, impact, devastating impact of, of this uh, uh, global pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, today I checked the number, the uh, uh, 180 million uh, people have been affected and um, uh, and with uh, more than four million have passed away and it's um, uh, we feel so sad about that and um, uh, this whole uh, pandemic had has yet to be uh, uh, brought under control we're raising against against time uh, to try to uh, control it uh, uh, and 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 I I hope that uh, all over the world, each of us can all see, you know, when when a catastrophe really materialized, when a risk really materialized, uh, uh, how challenging for us to control that. And uh, uh, as you mentioned, that uh, the climate impact, uh, you know, if that risk, climate risk, really materialized. Uh, uh, it will be far more difficult for us to try to try to control, try to reverse the trend. So I'm happy to see, even during the pandemic, uh, not just Europe continued to be the torch barrel, and U.S. came back, you know, to to Paris Agreement, uh, uh, but China, you know, my country, um, uh, last September, President Xi represent China to make the uh, uh, 2060 carbon neutrality pledge. I think this is um, uh, mm. this is very important, uh, and I'm happy to see 120 countries uh, now have joined this global race to zero, have committed to, uh, to carbon neutrality. Uh, it won't be mm. easy, you know. We have uh, more than yes. 10 billion. So it won't be easy. We we have to uh, spare no efforts to achieve. It won't that. be easy. Yes, it won't be easy. A big challenge ahead. And we are, as you say, Marjun, still reeling in many parts of the world from the uh, from the devastating impact of COVID-19. Um, Senator Sarah Hansen-Young, if I could come to you with a with a related question, then how do you link the two? How do you link uh, the, the, the experience of dealing with climate change and the push toward uh, sorry, dealing with COVID-19 and the push towards taking climate change threats more seriously? How optimistic do you feel about that? Well, um, hello, and again, uh, uh, thank you so much for um, being involved in this program. I think this is a wonderful opportunity. And uh, coming from Australia, of course, uh, it adds even more weight to the fact that um, our nation needs to be playing a much uh, larger role in helping to reduce carbon pollution and re uh, a carbon target. Uh, and I must say uh, right up front, much sooner than 2050. I and mean, we are in the crucial decade right now. And some would say, oh, well, this is all too fast. This is all too soon. But what COVID has shown us is that when we are faced with such a crisis, with such 
uh, chaos. Uh, leaders can listen to scientists and experts and come together and drive change hard and fast when we need to. I mean, who would have thought that this time last year that we would have had uh, the vaccines that we have available now right around the world? And of course, we need more effort in making sure there is equitable distribution and those who uh, are really struggling um, uh, get access to those uh, vaccines uh, now and faster and in the quantities that they need. But just the development um, of that uh, over the last 12 months has been extraordinary. And I think uh, uh, you could roll out uh, that type of response so quickly. And it's come because of leadership. Mm. It's come because the community has demanded it. And uh, let me say uh, right up front, it's come because politicians, people uh, you know, uh, like myself, an elected member and governments have listened to the scientists and the experts and said, OK, you think we can do this? We will throw our weight behind you. Let's get it done. Mm. Um, that's the type of response we need now on the climate crisis. Uh, the technologies are there. The uh, ideas are there. The public will is there. Uh, what we now need is is that leadership uh, from from nation states. Okay. Um, and of course, uh, coming from Australia, um, there's a lot of effort being put in at the local level, at the state, at the provincial level, but uh, not as much effort uh, at the federal uh, and national level. And that's where we need focus now. OK, and we'll certainly talk about that. Uh, and your point is well made, uh, Senator, that the, the last year or two has certainly shown us what is possible, that big change can happen, big action is, is possible. Mayor Yvonne uh, uh, Aki Sawyer, if I could come to you uh, now, it's all very well for, for, for countries with deep pockets and huge financial resources to talk about what is possible on climate change. But has the fight against COVID-19 made it more difficult in many poorer countries, and I'm thinking here in particular about parts of Africa, made it more difficult to take bold action on climate because, you know, these economies are still dealing with COVID-19 and then they'll have to rebuild? Um, that's absolutely the case. And, you know, in, in many ways, it's, it's predictable. Um, there's a number of African countries, large amounts, mine not uh, um, excluded, um, we're on a path to growth. Um, a bumpy path, um, which even the way the, the global economy is structured can sometimes uh, accentuate and um, amplify and increase um, existing inequalities. And what COVID has done in, it has been to increase the number of people who find themselves in this position. So we, we know the statistics are telling us that we've got over 100 million people now uh, who are added to those who could be considered to be in abject poverty. Um, and those people are living in, a, in countries and economies which are struggling. Um, the first and second waves of COVID were fairly kind to most of, of West Africa, certainly. I mean, we in Sierra Leone, my city had less than 250, 2,500 cases up until a month ago. But the third wave has been, um, and the, the economic impact of the first and second wave far exceeded the health impact. But clearly now we're catching up on both. It means that when, where we were already articulating the gap between the climate um, intentions and the financing to deal with that pre-COVID, um, that conversation is just going to become more difficult because you're talking about weak mm. health systems um, and and you're talking about adaptation. And I think you said, or maybe it was Michael Bloomberg who said in his introduction, that the countries who are most affected by climate are the ones who contributed least. But the, the challenge we all face is that the concept of leaving no one behind I think we might have momentarily lost the mayor. We'll be back to her. We'll try and re-establish that connection and be back to her shortly. Her really interesting points that she was making there, though, about uh, about the way that her campaign is being fought across Africa and the impact that that is having. Let's take you to our poll uh, results, then. We asked uh, of this broadcast, and we wanted to get a 
sense of you would, you the audience would join together the themes of COVID-19 and climate change. And these are the results. So we asked the question, do you think that COVID-19 has made humanity more aware uh, of the even greater catastrophe of climate change? And this is really interesting in itself, the way that the results are really evenly split here. 34% saying yes, this was a wake up call. 34% saying somewhat, not entirely sure. 31% saying no, when the pandemic is over, it will be business as usual. I suppose if you're an optimist, if you're looking to push forward, make progress on climate change, you could add uh, the 34 in the and consider them maybe uh, maybe room to room to persuade a few more uh, to join to join the yes camp. But anyway, those are the results from the audience uh, entirely uh, valid to get input and throw that into our conversation. I'll wait a little uh, to see if we get uh, establish our conversation with Mayor Yvonne Akisoya and uh, I'll go back. I'll, I'll go to uh, to Mark. Uh, Marjun, very good to, to speak to you. And you talked in your opening remarks just a moment ago about how China has pivoted its approach on climate change. And it has now made this announcement that China will achieve carbon neutrality by 26, uh, 2060. What has driven that, do you think? Is this a wake up uh, within the Communist Party, uh, the actions of climate activists? What is driving this, uh, this change of approach from the Chinese government? Yeah, I think this uh, driving force is uh, coming from the multi-stakeholder, uh, multi-stakeholders, uh, uh, not just the government. Of course, the Chinese government have, have pivoted its policy, but uh, uh, but behind that is also the uh, the people. You know, uh, years ago when Beijing and the surrounding regions suffer from long stretch of smoggy days, uh, or when you know in uh, in a week uh, that the, the the airplane could not land and we could not quite see the the other side the other, the next uh, uh, door building uh, you know people made their voice uh, uh, on uh, over internet and uh, over social media and uh, this um, this have uh, motivated uh, the government to come up with policy to monitor and then disclose pm 2.5 and then drive uh, uh, a, a national uh, action plan on clean air and um, uh, and this has opened way toward control the climate change because they you know both carbon dioxide and uh, and the local emission came from the very similar sources uh, so uh, through all these efforts uh, china's vast expansion of coal consumption have been brought under certain control and uh, through this approach we have seen the uh, beijing's air quality uh, improved significantly and um, and, and this has uh, have built the confidence uh, that uh, you know, by going green, there's a way to try to decouple the growth uh, from the uh, from the pollution. Uh, and, um, uh, and and when China became the second largest economy in the world, uh, it's also you know there's also a need for China to upgrade uh, to try to uh, achieve a, a much greener recovery. So I think all these are behind. Uh, the the, yes. the the thinking. Having, having said that, I have to say that the pandemic have uh, created a lot of uh, uh, world economic uncertainties. Uh, to 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 hedge against that, uh, you know, many local regions uh, unfortunately try to relax environmental control, so which resulted in a in a rather big rebound of our carbon emission. So I think this 2060 carbon neutrality pledge came at a critical moment. So now the challenge is how to yes. bring this national national ambition down to where those uh, more than 10 billion tons of carbon are actually emitted. And we are working, tapping into the IT technology, big data, creating a uh, blue map for zero carbon to try to help achieve that. Yes, and you've been uh, you've been increasing transparency, I suppose, on the environmental questions in China, Marjun, around carbon carbon emissions, around water quality. How is the national government on, on board with what you're doing, trying to, to, to shine a light on where action still needs to be taken? Yes, uh, I have. If there's, uh, uh, you know, we have seen a historical progress made in China's uh, environmental transparency. You know, more than 10 years ago, air quality, water quality, and the emission data from the, uh, from the corporations uh, were not very accepted. But we have developed the index uh, to help 
you know, assess the performance and gradually we have seen a real big progress. You know, the first year when we started gathering all this monitoring data, we, we can compile only 2,000 records. Uh, but today that violation records have topped uh, 2 million. Now, because of all this online monitoring have been made public for the first time in the world. So every day our database can gather 3.5 million pieces of, uh, of data, you know, on air quality, water quality, and also the corporate uh, discharge data every hour. And based on that, we turn that into the dynamic uh, environmental credit assessment to, mm. to, uh, to more than 5 million companies in China. And this color code, even during the pandemic, I'm, I'm, I was most uh, excited when during the pandemic, one of the largest state-owned banks decided to tap into this data to uh, run through tens of thousands of the companies who want to borrow money from them. And, um, uh, and, and so far, all this green supply chain and green finance application have motivated uh, uh, ne uh, nearly six, 16,000 companies to openly improve their performance. Okay. Transparency. Uh, Mayor uh, Yvonne Akisoria, if I could uh, come to you. We were hearing there from Marjun about how experience of climate, sorry, about uh, air pollution in day-to-day -day life was one of the drivers for change in China. What would you say the driver or how, how have various drivers contributed to an urgent need for change on climate uh, in Sierra Leone? I understand that there was a recent wake-up call when you saw the partial collapse of the Sugarloaf Mountain in 2017, which had really tragic consequences and huge loss of life. How has that changed the, uh, the climate change narrative in Sierra Leone? Um, and people, it's, you know, the, the, that landslide you, you described cost the city or cost the country about $35 million. A thousand people lost their lives in under five minutes. But this is becoming a regular occurrence. So there's a tension here. And I think it's important that we recognize that whilst we're not great emitters, the we so our contribution has been um, seeing the devastation of climate, which has led to abnormal um, normally heavy rainfall, um, un unpredictable weather patterns, driven rural urban migration, more people living in the city, cutting down more trees, that leading to more, that deforestation, leading to landslides, leading to water shortages. Um, so it's a, it's a really vicious cycle of running mm. away from the impact of climate change and then contributing to localized climate change and really poor air quality. So it's, it's been really helpful. I mean, just the other day I had, yesterday literally, um, I had a meeting with Fridays for Future kids um, concerned about climate. Um, and we have kind of narrowed it down. And this is why I say there's the tension. We've narrowed it down to one of our strongest messages to get, the mess, to get people on board is to stop deforestation. But then you've got the economy. Because sadly, in the last three years, we've moved from having mining as the major export to having timber as the country's major export. Timber going to China, interestingly enough. So where do we, how do we join these dots? How do we move away from um, as, as, as uh, I want to quote Greta here, mind the gap, the difference between what is being said in various climate circles and actually what we're allowing to happen. So if deforestation is being fueled by a demand for timber um, and that itself is, is creating more pressure, of course, also reducing the, the carbon uh, um, sink, um, but you're doing it because there, the jobs are not being promoted. A senator mentioned that at the local level, we are promoting in Freetown green jobs, but the national level, yes. you see um, timber being promoted as the new economy. Uh, so so these, these, cha these challenges, these dichotomies um, need to be addressed. Okay, uh, and let's get to Senator uh, Sarah Hansen-Young next then. And uh, Senator, the Australian government often frames the climate debate in terms of a trade-off between the environment and jobs. We heard Mike Bloomberg at the, at the top of this hour talking about how he sees there's a path for uh, sustainable growth 
uh, going forward. And I know you've expressed that view many times. How do you square that concern, though, around the economy, around jobs in an economy like Australia's, which is so reliant still on the mining sector, the extractive sector? Well, thank you. G great question. And you're right. The Australian government and those who have really held back uh, ambitious uh, climate policy in Australia have uh, always used this argument of it's the environment versus jobs. Uh, it's the same argument that was used in relation to native forest logging, uh, funnily enough, uh, in, uh, you know, throughout uh, the 80s, 90s and, and still continues in some parts of Australia that uh, it's if we don't, you know, don't log these trees, then people don't have jobs. Um, the issue, of course, is that we are now getting to a crunch point where the cost of business as usual is uh, now starting to create uh, a, a burden on the jobs and the uh, economy into the future. I'm um, thinking about, right, is going to announce in the next uh, week or so uh, their rules for um, how they will deal with carbon adjustment at borders. So Australia is going to have to start to grapple with this. If we want to be trading with uh, nations around the world, we have to start considering the extra cost that that's going to mean for our goods that are traded if we don't price carbon properly here in Australia, if we don't actually start putting uh, proper checks and balances on reducing pollution. That is going to create an economic burden for Australia. Um, of course, we've got amazing uh, array uh, here in Australia of renewable energy sources. We're the sunniest uh, uh, continent on Earth and uh, solar energy in particular is just abundant. Wind energy is amazing. We've got huge uh, space to, to build uh, hmm. renewable energy farms. Um, that in itself uh, would create an advantage for a country like Australia in uh, uh, green steel other types of what would be usually quite intensive manufacturing and intensive uh, energy yes. uh, uh, industry being able to be run by very cheap, clean power. Uh, it's just about a mindset okay. change. Uh, and at the moment, our policy in Australia is dominated, is run uh, by the interests of those big fossil fuel companies who are digging, mining and shipping overseas. Just one last fact before before you throw off, because I think this is really important. Australia is the third largest exporter of fossil fuels in the world. So we might like to say that we can't participate and, and, and be as, uh, play a big role. But if we were to transition that export to clean energy, to clean resources, to clean goods, we would have a significant impact on the whole planet's climate.